the symbols of the baptism in the Old Testament. And this is part, by God's grace, of a bigger study that we started about 13 weeks ago, which is how the sacraments is the fulfillment of the grace of salvation. We described the fall and, and how Christ had to come in a human nature to save us from the result of the fall, which is our death, our corruption, and our separation from God which is exemplified that not to approach the tree of life anymore. So what is the solution as we went through it in detail? The solution was to unite us with him. And how do you unite us with him? There is one sacrament that unites us with Christ, namely the sacrament of communion. To prepare us for the sacrament of communion, he has to make us enjoy the resurrection, that we don't die again ever. So we have to be baptized. And before he gave us that he can enter us, we have to be a house of God. So that's how he gives us also the sacrament of chrismation. And these two sacraments are what we're studying after we cover the communion. We spent about the last 12 weeks in uh, covering the communion as uh, in the Old Testament, because we see it clearly in the New Testament. So what we're doing now is to see what is the foundation for these sacraments also in the Old Testament? If God made a plan in order to make, to make sure that this plan is correct and people believe in it, it's more credible to prophesy about it than to write about it after it happens. And that's the beauty of the Old Testament. We should never, ever um, leave it as a second priority. Um, the strength of it is to write about events before they happen. So the sequence that we did, we described the creation as our church, the creation, we lived in a church with God, we lived in, around the tree of life, we lived in the paradise, and then we broke this relationship when the devil fell and he enticed us to fall as well. And then God fixed it by taking our image, overcoming death, overcoming Satan, overcoming the corruption, living a holy life, and then he allowed himself to be crucified by his own will on the holy wood of the cross. He resurrected and he passed this to us by the three pivotal sacraments that he unites us with him in, in communion, that is the goal. That is the, that's why we call it, it's the mystery of the mysteries. It's the most important one. And before this, he makes us resurrect and he makes us to be sanctified. So the, con the concept of resurrecting and the concept of sanctification, do we find symbols for it in the Old Testament? Absolutely. Otherwise, otherwise he would not have said, I did not come to demolish the law, but to fulfill it. And that's hence we not focus on the sacraments in the New Testament because that's easy or at least clear, it's fulfilled. But when, is it written in the old? We had about nine symbols of communion. And then we studied a book, the full book, which is the Song of Songs. The Song of Songs is the ultimate marriage between two people, God and me. And this marriage happens in the communion. So because it's only two to become one happens in the sacrament of marriage. Um, sacrament of marriage, you can actually allocate something to it because the, the wedding at the Cana of Galilee, it's, a, it's, it's a amazing which day it fell on and why was it the first miracle that St. John tells us about. But I don't want to deviate tonight and want to continue in the baptism. So after we cover the communion in the Old Testament by eight symbols or nine symbols, uh, we're going to cover, we cover also the book of Song of Songs. Now we're, we're going to cover the two other sacraments that God has prepared us for him. And this is namely the baptism and the holy chrismation, the anointment with the oil to receive the Holy Spirit, which gives sanctification. Sanctification is what we could not achieve in the Old Testament but could only be achieved in the New Testament by the Holy Spirit. But it is symbols for sanctification. The Old Testament, oh, it's, it's replete. This is the whole point, is to become holy and be sanctified and be clean, but it's also only for the flesh because it cannot be for the spirit, because Christ hasn't come yet. So we'll cover from um, symbol number four tonight, because we covered the first three in, last time. And all of these get uploaded to our church website, the coc.org, under Bible Understanding School. I have been delayed, but um, I uploaded 
finish the book of Song of Solomon and I will upload the last time and this time together. Anybody remembers the one, one or two or three? Anybody wants to refresh our memory? What was Genesis 1-2? And the spirit hovering over um, the waters before the earth was created. After the earth was created, before the earth was inhabited. So God baptized the earth before we lived in it, which means he made it holy, he made it sanctified. That concept is, we, we, we don't notice it easily, but we need that the any place where God dwells with us has to be sanctified before he enters it. Hence, you receive the Holy Spirit before you receive the communion, but you cannot receive the Holy Spirit before you die and resurrect to become a clean vessel because you cannot take new wine and put it in old wine skins. So I re keep repeating this because the church is not about rules. The church makes sense. The, ch the church is very logical. God has really, really kind of engineered the salvation. It's very, very logical to, to the order it's, it's happened. And he prepared symbols for it in order when it happens, nobody doubts it because it has been told, foretold about it from the beginning of the world. In fact, Genesis 1, 2 is that the, before God lives with his people in a certain place, the Holy Spirit has to sanctify that place, which is very profound to notice the symbol that early. So if the fall hadn't happened, we would, the church was the, the church and the paradise are one thing. The whole earth was the church. You don't need to go to church. You live with God in paradise, and that's the church. And everybody would. Okay, Genesis 17, what was it? And we compared it with Romans 2 and Acts 7 about taking off something. It's circumcision of the heart. Exactly. So Genesis 17 is the circumcision of the flesh. And then we notice that the apostles understood it is that circumcision is no longer needed in the New Testament because that would be works of the law and we cannot put the works of the law in the church. It would damage the church because we cannot put the symbol with the real. Once the real happens, you throw away the symbol completely. So you throw away circumcision and how circumcision now is about taking off my bad actions. And in Genesis 7, he said, take it off to take, to take it off away from us. And you notice some amazing verses in Romans and Acts about taking off and being, when St. Stephen tells them, you are uncircumcised in the heart, which means your heart needs to take off the evil from it. So the baptism is literal. We die and resurrect with Christ, Romans 6, 4, Colossians 2, 12. And the circumcision is now symbolic, which is to cut out from myself the evil nature, which is alien to me. So the, 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 the symbol of baptism to take part of you and throw it away, that was going to be basically that God will take your old nature and throw it away. It gets trapped in the water. And that's why there is liturgy for the water. You notice I'm not discussing the, how the sacrament is done because this is really not important at this point. We have to understand the foundation for the sacrament, the biblical foundation for the sacrament. Why the sacrament, not how the sacrament. How can, can, can cover it very, very well later, but I'm caring now more about, about why. Um, what, is, what about number three? Exactly, and how did new life come, came out in, in, in three? What was the new life symbolized by? The dove. Hmm? The, dove. the dove, but what about, what does First Peter 3 say about it? You probably haven't read it, but you can, well, let's open it now. Let's open First Peter 3 because we talked mainly about the flood and the dove compared to the raven and 150 days and how long it took to build the ark and how the three wives are at, at, at associated with Noah more than their parents. All of this is like, leave your own family and stick now with this man of God. And the 150 days, which is in Revelation, we found the 150 days are the days where the um, bottomless pit army uh, can, can make the people live in pain for 150 years if they are touched by the, by the tail of the scorpions. So it, it's amazing link between Revelation and Genesis. But what does it, let somebody read First Peter 3, uh, 20 or 20, how would you tell her, you read it for us? Who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, and in a few, that is, eight souls were saved through water. 
There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism. Not the removal of filth from the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience for God, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Is this verse clear? Anybody wants to explain it? What verse is it? First Peter three twenty and twenty one. What else? Let's open it here. The time, it has something to do with the times of Noah to prepare the ark because it talks about how like it took it would have taken years and years and years. Hundred years, it did. Yes. To prepare it, and that whole time he stayed strong. Okay. What else? Removal, yes. Not as a removal of the dirt from the body, because that is the Old Testament. Everything was to the flesh. And now you'll understand St. Paul's epistles much better, because he's going to say, I am not going to be focusing on the glory of the flesh, because Jews do this, and I'm no longer a Jew. I'm going to focus on the glory of the Spirit, which is, that's why he... He got perceived as a breaker of the law. So all of the works of the Old Testament are for the flesh. And that's why when the New Testament comes, no longer, no longer we do the Old Testament actions. What else? There is more. Life came from those eight that were saved. New life. New life came out of the ark. Remember what we said about the dimensions of the ark? 300 cubits times 50 times 30. These are the same proportions of the human. The, our height compared to our width compared to our thickness. If it was the thickness. <laughs> and that's Christ. That's a symbol of Christ. It's just as if it's a human bringing us out from death to life. And that fulfills what St. Paul is saying. If anybody is in Christ, he's a new creation. <laughs> you find it here in Noah. So you find Christ, that's Christ's body. When we hide in it, we die with him and we resurrect with him. So death is happening to the evil nature that's the outside the ark. While in Christ, nobody dies. So the ark itself is Christ, which is going to be communion, because if we don't have communion, we're outside the body of Christ. If we're not baptized, we're not in the congregation of Christ. And remember that keep, this is the Bible study vision that I would like us to ascribe to, and hopefully we'll go to the servants. Congregation and location rituals. Congregation location rituals. This is applies baptism, house of God, heavenly rituals, that's the communion. If we apply it to the paradise, Adam and Eve is the congregation, the location is the paradise, the ritual is Eat from the tree of life, don't eat from the tree of knowledge, good and evil. When we fell from this, now is going to, we're going to look at the Old Testament through these three, three through this vision, this glasses of congregation, place for the congregation, and a way for the congregation to approach God. But there is no salvation. Only this is done in the New Testament where the congregation is by baptism. We're born and resurrected again. The location is you. You are the house of the Holy Spirit. And the ritual is the communion. And we don't call it a ritual. It's basically the heavenly service. And there is a very nice comparison. Maybe I'll do it with you one day, um, comparing this to the, to the book of Revelation, how we see the, the liturgy in the book of Revelation. The Bible is unbelievably inseparable. It's like there is no hole, there is no crevice. Everything is like cemented together by the sacraments, because if it's taken outside, there's no way to link things. There's no way to link this. And it's by, by the apostles. It's St. It's Peter himself who's saying, and baptism, so I, I don't know where we're to, he says, and baptism, which is, which this prefigured, what this Noah. So St. Peter and the magnificent epistle of St. Paul to the Hebrews is tells us how to read the Old Testament. The Old Testament is the shadow of the real things. He says this literally in Hebrews 8. And St. Peter, who's much less learned than St. Paul, he looks at this event of Noah and this is an antitype. This is a foreshadowing. This is a symbol. This is this is telling us what's coming. And it's it's serious because this is death. Everybody outside the body, every person outside the body of Christ, will wither. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. 
and we have to be grafted into the, the vine, Romans and, um, and St. John. Once we have this vision, which we're, we're building together, that baptism, chrismation, communion is what holds the Bible together, and the mountain, the transfiguration mountain is the communion where you get transfigured. Imagine the liturgies like your St. Peter and St. James and St. John going together with Christ into the mountain. And then at the top of the mountain, he becomes different. And he, they want to build three tabernacles, means three memorials, three houses to remember this event. And, and, it, and it's actually, it is the communion because God will take us with him, but will not come down from the mountain separate from him, will come down from the mountain united with him. So each one of us comes to the liturgy to be transfigured. It's not a ritual. You can tell yourself in the morning, I'm going to heaven for three hours and coming back to earth. Because literally where Christ is, heaven is. So here is the scripture itself tells us by the Holy Spirit, as St. Peter reads it, explains it, and this is the mind of the apostles, that's called the apostolic church. When they read the Old Testament, they, they now see in it the New Testament completely. So when they look at Noah, they find that this is the baptism. So these are the first three the first three symbols, and I will get into much more beautiful stuff. So let's open First Corinthians. Andrew, I want you to read for us the whole chapter. Let me see, I might stop. First Corinthians 10. <clears throat> Any question about Noah? So Noah carried the cross for 100 years to build an ark where no ark is built. Noah was able in his holiness to affect his three step to, his, his three um, in-laws, um, daughters, daughters-in-law, that they actually left their parents and stuck with him without any pressure from him. It's an amazing family to have that effect. The eight souls are the number eight is, I didn't say this, the resurrection, because the, we, the fathers look at the seven days of the creation and this is the fall. The following day or the new creation is the number eight and it relies on St. Peter because it's by eight souls who were saved. And this is an antitype of the baptism. The size of the ark is the size of a human and that human definitely salvation through water inside the human and we come out as a new life. <laughs> that cannot be anything but the incarnation. Uh, the raven and the, and the dove, the raven is a, is a hypocrite Christian who can live outside the ark. So after the 40 days of the tsunami and the rain stopped, Noah started sending these animals out, uh, sorry, birds out. So he sent the raven for extended period of time, he's confused. Mm -hmm. And then three weeks before the 150 days, he started sending a dove. Didn't come back, the, after, the week after came back with an olive branch symbol of St. Mary as the, there is a sign for salvation here, there's a hope. And then the third, the third week, which much matches the 150 days, he sends the dove and the dove doesn't come back. So the raven lives off remains of the human bodies, um, dead bodies. He can live outside the ark and he can live inside the ark equally well. That's the hypocrite Christian. He's very well functioning in the church and outside. And I mean by functioning like sitting. Um, while the dove couldn't find a place to put her foot. So had to come back because this, this, this type of floating corpses on the surface of the water is not where the dove could, could live. So would come back. The first two doves and then the third one um, were, was able to go out and not come back. Um, as we open 1 Corinthians 10, we're going to show a very unique way how the apostles used the terms of the Old Testament. St. Peter didn't do it, um, but St. Peter told us clearly this is baptism. So he's telling us when you read the Old Testament from now on, the events that happen are not just bedtime stories. This is salvation. Every event a symbol of salvation. Oh, the last time we mentioned also in the evening. What did we say about the evening last time? Remember what we said about the evening? Because the, the dove came at the evening with the olive branch. And the evening has a significance. It's never too late. It's never too late, exactly. The prayer of the 11th hour. What else? What other events happen, what other events happen in the evening? 
Christ's death on the cross, exactly the tune of Vayet of Enf, that his father smelled them in the evening on the Golgotha. What else? <laughs> About marriage. Something had to marriage. Isaac. What is about Isaac? Oh, oh. Uh, oh wait, no, that was <laughs> <laughs> There's something about Israel in the evening? <laughs> Not kidding, I was thinking that uh, he, he wrestled with God at night. Very well. So uh, th that adds up to it. I didn't, I didn't mention this, but I, never, I didn't even notice this. But if it is, it fits. So when you read, when you read the time of the day was these blessings happen, God tells us, God tells us when evil becomes very strong or when you feel that I'm not coming out, I will come. <clears throat> it's never too late. And the 11th hour, it's exactly the parable, the 11th hour giving them the same reward as the first hour. Um, it means that the threshold, once you cross it, every, you can get into the kingdom of heaven. Of course, in the kingdom of heaven, those of the first hour are going to have uh, more reward than the, than, the, than the 11th. But it means that everybody can be saved, even if he's at the 11th hour. But since we know what our 11th hour is, so we better work from the beginning of the day. Andrew, can you read for us? I want us to read from one uh, to... From one to four, and then we'll continue. We'll just read from um, First Corinthians 10, from one to four. Yes. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Okay. What is the style that Saint Paul is using here? I know it's a difficult question, but not 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 poetic style. But he's mixing two things together. So he's taking elements of the New Testament, mixing them with the Old, and vice versa. Instead of elements, what 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 is well, different? Symbolic, or uh, we'll say rather than symbolic fulfillment. Oh, so, okay. No, you're right. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. He's taking verbs of salvation and applies them to the Old Testament event. And again, I keep repeating, don't ever use the word Bible stories. Let us always use Bible events because as time progresses, believe me, it's going to be just Bible stories and then fairy tales and then myth and then dies. And, and, and the, now the subliminal messages in the culture is very, very strong about this, so it's Bible events. So the events, events of the New Old Testament, he's describing it by terms of the New Testament. Having said this, can you spot them? Can you find them? Andrew, give us the hint. So can you find here where he uses verbs of the New Testament to describe events of the Old Testament? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Baptized into Moses in the cloud. And where else? Hmm? No, can we stay in two just to, in the cloud and where else we'll go to eight but oh, and, in the sea. and in the sea okay. so the event of crossing the red sea the red sea there is two groups went into the red sea and one group came out and the old group or the bad group or the evil group was trapped that is what baptism does it gives us a new nature. Our old nature, our fallen nature, our death nature is trapped by the water. And only the new nature is, is, is given to us. So he's telling us here, they were baptized by Moses into the cloud and into the sea. Of course, this is not New Testament baptism. But we see in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, the fulfillment. And this is teaching us how to read the Old Testament, is it because he's using New Testament verbs with Old Testament events. And these events are long time, 1500 years before, before the event happened. What is number three? The spiritual drink. Oh, 
be the rock that Moses hit with his staff. No, no, but before oh, we get sorry. to the rock, I'm sorry. just let's stick to three and four. Three and four is, is just a... Yeah, that's, that is the rock. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what is the spiritual food and the spiritual drink? Right, that is the, that is the event. What What is the real? <laughs> exactly. Hmm? Sorry, Rebecca. These aren't trick questions. <laughs> they are not trick questions. They are very straightforward. But but you see how, how an apostolic Pharisee now, or Pharisee then, apostolic now, how he reads the Old Testament? He says, baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And they all ate the same food. And they all drank the same drink. He's telling us not every Christian will enter the kingdom of heaven. He's going to warn them the rest of the chapter and in chapter 11. And in chapter 11, he will get to the peak, which tells us that he knows exactly what the communion is. He received it from Christ. And he will warn us that people die and get sick because they take communion unworthily. He's warning them from this. So he starts from chapter 8 to 10. Later on in the rest of 10, he will describe about the food for the idols and so on. I just don't want to get to mix it, but it's, the, uh, it's, it's it, I can't, if I started, I won't, I won't start. It's just unbelievable when you study each case and, and, and analyze. Okay, Andrew, you were saying what? And, and Iman, you, you, before we get to it, I, wish, I want to stay here a little bit because there is more and more things in it. Well, I thought it was, I mean, it's actually profound, but at the same time, Time somewhat confounding. He talks about how they drank of the, the spiritual drink, for they drank of the spiritual rock, and that's I think a reference to Moses striking the rock with mm -hmm. his rod and water coming out, and that rock was Christ. But that that almost why I say it confounds me is because it almost it it, uh, it relates Christ to almost a creation that God created yes for the salvation of the people but i hate to say it but it, it almost strips christ of his glory almost as though he were because he used the rock well the rock was just it was just a rock that brought forth water and that to compare christ to that isn't that kind of isn't that somewhat diminutive i see what what you're saying but the it's not comparison of Christ because the rock being Christ is that he's, you, you might look at him and you see there's, there's nothing good come, can, can come out of it, but it's water that comes out of it. And the rock followed them, the rock was not moving behind them. So it, he, he's looking at it in, in, in that the, our Christ is the source of life in the wilderness. In salvation, correct. So it's, it's, a, it's a symbolic. It's not like, for example, all of the elements of the tabernacle are symbolic for the incarnation. The, the Ark of Covenant, the urn of manna, um, the, the, the lampstand, the table of showbread, the altar of incense, all of the items, the curtains, everything is Christ. Everything is Christ. So here he's saying, even in the wilderness, so the house of God, this is not demeaning. Yeah, this, we're describing the house of God, the tabernacle. But symbolizing him as a rock, it, you find it just that. No, I just, I feel like we look at Christ as being our salvation. God had bestowed, he, he had given us, I, for lack of a better term, he'd given us Christ as a, the road to salvation. But we refer to God, or we refer to Jesus Christ as God. Mm -hmm. Of course. Whereas if we go back in the Old Testament, Moses did not refer to the rock as God. Of course, of but course. That's what I'm saying is that it's not quite analogous. Christ it's symbolic. And Christ is hidden. God, but, like for example, and the rock and God. Yeah, but but how can Christ be a lamb? You're, you, there's an animal. So how can Christ be an animal? It's the same concept. You so that, that's it. that's symbolic. But where, whereas Jesus Christ, I don't know if that was symbolic. I think that was God. Well, Saint Paul is using these events to see through them that these are symbols of Christ because. Because when they went to the Red Sea, the symbol of baptism, they were not baptized. When they when they ate the manna and the and the and the and, the, and, the, and they drank the water from the rock, that's not communion. But St. Paul is using this example for what is that all of the congregation got exposed to blessing, but not everybody entered the promised land. He's going to use it to to warn us in the New Testament. 
But in the meantime, the way he's doing it, he's linking both of them. And that's the beauty is that the sacraments of the church, when we hear about them, they didn't come out of thin air. Now when we read it this way, oh, the whole Old Testament, and that's exactly the whole point of why I chose the studies. I want to find these sacraments in the Old Testament and all symbols, however great or, 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 or not, it's all symbols. Okay, so we have now, we haven't finished. Hmm? The cornerstone? The cornerstone between the Old and the New Testament, yes. The builder, the stone which the builders have rejected is the cornerstone. So of course the, the rock was not moving after them, but it tells us in the wilderness, when, you're, when you can't find water, the water can come out from a rock. God can sustain us no matter how, um, how the wilderness is. Okay, but this way of approach, I just wanted us to know that how St. Peter and how St. Paul, they both used New Testament salvation statements with Old Testament events. And this is how both testaments are linked together. There's no separation between them. Let's continue in 1 Corinthians 10 a little bit. Continue past five. Yes. We're at five. <clears throat> but with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, and do not become idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality, as some of them did, and in one and in one day twenty three thousand fell, nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents, nor complain, as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admoni ad admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as, such, as is, such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way, for escape, make, make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless it is not the communication is not the communion of is the it not? Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Okay. So thank you. What is he trying to say here? What is St. Paul trying to say here? Because it links very much to what we're saying that the baptism is the fulfillment of the of the Old Testament. But he's trying to warn us from something here. What is he warning us from? And he's using Old Testament. That is the beauty of this chapter. He's using Old Testament events to describe New Testament grace. And this tells us that the Old and the New Testament are one. And the Old hands over to the New. And the Old is even more I don't want to say more beautiful, but because salvation is hidden in it and it was written before the event, that's why it's more credible. Things written after the event are less credible than things written even before the event by thousands of years. And St. Paul is using it because he, has, he understands it and he, he was given the communion by Christ. So what is he telling us to, to be afraid of? Hmm? I was going to say, well, in verse, uh, this is kind of a question. Um, he says in uh, in verse eight, um, he talks about how twenty three thousand fell. Was this in is this in reference to Sodom and Gomorrah? No, this is a reference when they when they built the calf, and then the Moses came down from the from the mountain and found the calf was built, and they were worshiping through sexual immorality. Hmm. And then he said, "Who is going to be with me?" And then the Levites said, "We're with you." And then he they had swords and killed the people and purified the congregation. 
And I, I think I described this here before that the Old Testament priesthood, which is the Levites, started by blood, started by purification, purifying the people. This is exactly what happened because he said they ate and drank and they stood up to play. Stood up to play is the polite word of saying they fell into sexual immorality. Moses came with the Ten Commandments in his hand. He saw this and then he threw it. And because he threw it in, in Exodus 34, God asked him to, to cut stones and God would write on it. This is all to us is that they were all baptized. They all ate the same food and drank the same drink. They were followed by the rock and the rock was Christ. But when they started doing sexual immorality, they fell. So several, several layers here, but I, I want to hear Taylor, we were going to say something. That he's telling us that we're, that we're human just like they were in the Old Testament. So we're susceptible to sin just as they were. Um, but we have the communion of the body and the blood of Christ. So sort of like we have a hand up. And after his, after he brought his salvation, that they didn't have back in Right, very good. What are the two results of sin that he talks about here? They were destroyed. They were destroyed, and what else? They were susceptible to what? What type of things destroyed them? They were destroyed by the sword. This is the purification that, that the Levites did. And this is a good way to actually compare the Old Testament and the New Testament priesthood. The, New, the Old Testament priesthood started by blood. And the New Testament priesthood started by receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Absolution. So the Old Testament priesthood started by blood. The New Testament priesthood started by Absolving forgiveness. Serpents. What are the serpents? Temptations, the devils, exactly. What did God tell Eve? Tell, not tell the serpent. When after the fall happened, what was the, what was the serpent told by, by God? Mm -hmm. The seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. But the serpent will do what to the bruise his heel, not the not the mind anymore. So but it still can bruise. So God gave us authority over snakes, scorpions, and all the power of the enemy. And nothing will, will hurt us. That's, but the snake can still bruise our heel, which means can tempt us. But our heel, which means if we just lift our foot and crush the snake, it's going to be crushed. So it's up to us to leave your foot susceptible to the snake or not like this. When they fell into this, this because they, uh, this is, in, I think, in Numbers 8. You quote me on this. I think it's Numbers 8. When they started complaining, oh, manna every day, manna every day, manna every day. So snakes started to appear and started to bite them. And they, they said, sorry, <laughs> we're going to have manna every day. There's no problem. So that, how did how the problem was solved? The bronze, the bronze serpent, which is built for yourself, a bronze serpent. The bronze as an alloy or as a metal is reddish in color. And if anybody is bitten, just what? Look at it. And the venom will not affect the person. It's the best medicine ever. <laughs> That's Christ. And then, in fact, if you notice, that's why the bishop, when he comes, there is a, a bronze serpent always with him, the deacon. Because the bishop, a Gordian, I don't know if I did with you uh, the epistles of St. Ignatius or not, but maybe you should do them here. There is, is Christ in the church. Um, before I forget, so we, your seed will crush the head of the serpent. That's salvation. That's crushing Satan completely. But still Satan can attack our heels, not our heads. He has no longer authority over us. And, the, and he says here, so the, the adultery led them into being fallen by the sword, 23,000. And the complaining led them to be bitten by snakes. God did not destroy the snakes, but God gave them 
an ability to get rid of the venom of the snakes by just looking at him. Same thing, when Satan, when Lucifer became Satan, why God didn't destroy him? He would be like, <laughs> I don't know what, I can't describe what would be our case, but we would have no, no issues, no pain, paradise forever. This is implied that the serpent, um, at the time of tempting, tempting Eve, was, uh, may, have had a, may have had feet, because it says, it says, so the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle and, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between, the, and between your seed and her seed and each and head and the curse and the heel. But I just my wanted point to is, continue the point I was making <laughs> before I check so, the, sorry, the, I the feet of the snake. Allow me to digress, right? <laughs> I'll come. The, the quick answer, I, I don't know how the animals looked before the fall. Come on, you have to have had some, there's a file somewhere in there. <laughs> exactly what the serpent looked like. I'm yeah, just curious. That's a, it's a file, PDF. Let's treat this conception. I forgot what I was saying. <laughs> Uh, oh, the serpents, the serpents. He did not, he did not kill the serpents, but he gave us overcoming the serpent and the, and the bronze serpent, uh, um, putting it and we look at it. So when they complained and the serpent started biting them and started dying, when God forgave them, because they said, forgive us, we will not complain anymore. God gave a solution, but did not remove the serpents, which is exactly salvation. He did not destroy Satan but he gave us authority over Satan. And that's why the Old Testament, no matter how holy the person is, goes to Hades. There's no destruction to Satan. There's no overcoming Satan yet, but we need that seed. The seed remember when we discussed the seed of Abraham, which is in Genesis 12, the seed of, of Eve, that is in Genesis 3. That seed is Christ. Then with him, we can overcome Satan. Till the second coming happens, then Satan is completely demolished. And that's why we, we, we fall, and that's why we have the sacrament of repentance and confession, um, because the three, the three graces which we get can get tarnished, but we don't lose our Christianity because of the love of God. He allows us not to lose that, that identity ever, but we renew it by, by the repentance and confession. So all of this by baptism, that's why I wanted really much to, to focus on this sacrament. It's not, it's not just the coming with the baby and, and, and having a celebration. Um, the amount of investment that God is doing from Genesis and throughout the Old Testament and sending John the Baptist before him. He said, the one he sent before him called John the Baptist, like the one who will prepare the way his job is to baptize. Of course, it's not baptism for salvation, but to prepare, to prepare that the water is no longer going to be used for destruction as in number three, but the, Lord, the water is going to be used for forgiveness. So number four, which is basically... Do not, do not, after you're baptized and had communion, take, take sin easily. Um, okay. Iman, did you want to say something? You had uh, about eight? That's like 15 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> My, please, if you remember, just interject right away. <laughs> or send it to Andrew to ask me. <laughs> I love you, Andrew. I have no idea. Exodus 29. Let's go to the lab. Another symbol or foreshadowing. I like it more than or typology. The laver. The laver is a, is a basin of water that is described for Moses to build so that the priests wash themselves from blood before they enter the tabernacle. <clears throat> okay. Chapter twenty nine is the is the is the chapter of the Exodus twenty nine. Exodus twenty nine is the chapter of the consecration of priests of the first priest ever, high priest, which is or who is Aaron. And the rituals for this is 
are in chapter 29. Andrew, from one to, um, to four, and then we'll continue five after chapter 29. Yes, please, Exodus 29. And this is what you shall do to them, to hallow them for ministering to me as priests. Take one young bull and two rams without blemish, and unleavened bread, unleavened cakes mixed with oil, and unleavened wafers anointed with oil. You shall make them of wheat flour. You shall put them in one basket and bring them in the basket, and the bull and the two rams. And Aaron and his sons, you shall bring to the door of the tabernacle of, the, of meeting, and you shall wash them with water. Okay, so before before the priesthood, the, these priests and Aaron would be the high priest, and this is really the mercy of God is that is that the high priest was was a sinner before. He is actually when Moses was on the mountain, he 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 acquiesced to the pressure of the people, and he built for them this uh, this calf. And God is using that same man to become the high priest in the Old Testament. But it's this 29 is each one of us. So can you, can you relate anything in these four verses to what happens to you in the New Testament? Especially these, um, these offerings. How is these offerings related to you? Or to your faith? Because it's related to Christ. The unleavened bread is like the, the body. Um, how we, and it even says, like, and you put them in baskets, sort of like how we put our bread in, in the baskets when it's presented, presented before the priest. Um, and then you have the two rams and the young bull, which they'll probably be like, killed and their blood is a sacrifice. They want to kind of have Jesus' blood as a sacrifice. And then um, right there at the end, how the priests are going to be washed with water. So we're about to Excellent. We see here the elements of faith. All of the elements of faith are, in fact, in these four verses. The verses for consecrating a priest in the Old Testament. And in the New Testament, we are all priests in the sense of consecration. So this applies to all of us. First, we have to believe in the sacrifice of Christ. We have, to, we have to have a statement of faith before we get baptized. And that's the sacrifice that's the, the rams and the, why there is two, there is more detail in the consecration because he will use the blood to anoint him in, 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 in the ear and right ear and the right thumb and the right toe. There is certain symbolism in it, but I don't want to get into this. I, of course, the focus is on the water. But as we, as we understand, we're not studying rituals, we're studying how is, how is my identity in Christ is hidden in the Old Testament. Um, so number one, I confess the sacrifice of Christ. Second, about this um, grain offering, it's mixed with oil and it's anointed with oil. What does that mean? It says here, uh, and the unleavened bread, unleavened mean doesn't have yeast, which and yeast is a symbol of hypocrisy. That's using Christ's explanation himself. He said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Unleavened cakes mixed with oil and unleavened wafers spread with oil. So some are mixed, some are covered. And these are made with flour, which is crushed wheat that becomes white, mixed with oil and covered with oil and unleavened, doesn't have yeast. So that's basically, which happens very well with a grown up person being baptized is that the, the purification of the life of a baby by nature, of course, but the purification of the life and the behavior in order to be eligible to be washed by water. And Mixed with oil and covered with oil is the nature of Christ because Christ is one with the oil is the Holy Spirit. The oil is the Holy Spirit. Christ is mixed with oil means that him and the Holy Spirit are of one essence because the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, that's his divinity, is that Christ as God 
and the Holy Spirit as God and the Father are God are one essence. The essence of God is a triad, is a holy trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Covered with oil is us in Christ when we receive the Holy Spirit. When was Christ covered with oil? And I don't mean oil, I mean the Holy Spirit. When was Christ covered with oil? Remove the oil. When was Christ covered with the Holy Spirit? Exactly. Exactly. Therefore, that is why before he did anything and before he went fasting 40 days and 40 days, before the mission started completely, Christ was anointed with the Holy Spirit. Christ is God. Why does he need to be anointed? This is the because he's going through the same path we will go through. He got baptized, he got anointed, and he himself is Christ. He doesn't have to have communion. He's, he, that's him. But he's telling us, this is the path that you will go to. And it's all here in Exodus 29. Because you are a priest. In the New Testament, because you receive the Holy Spirit, you are a priest. You are consecrated to God. So you will believe in the salvation of Christ. You'll, be, you'll believe in what these two rams and, the, and, and, and the, um, the young bull and the two rams will do, which is uh, in the Old Testament atonement, in the New Testament remission. Atonement is covering, remission is erasing completely. These are the two differences between the terms in the Old and the New. Kafara, Ghufran. This, this in, 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 we don't focus much on this, unfortunately, but there is, this is a huge difference between the two. He converted the atonement into remission of sins. Old Testament has no remission of sins. Just atonement, covering, till, till the, the Savior comes. And your life, was, your life is in Christ, which is verse 2. Verse 2 is an unleavened bread, unleavened cakes, mixed with oil, and unleavened wafers spread with oil. Mixed with oil is only Christ. You're not mixed with oil. The Holy Spirit is not in your nature. But you will be covered with oil. The Holy Spirit will come on you, and then he, he lives in you all the time. But mixed with oil, as the Father's... Um, and be honest, the late Bishop of Harbiya interprets it that this is the Holy Spirit as being Christ's God. The Holy Spirit is with him as the Trinity. But before he started serving, he was anointed. That's why in, in English doesn't serve it well at all, but the Masih. The Masih means the anointed. You saw al Masih, which is the term in Arabic of Jesus Christ. The word Christ doesn't give the meaning, but it's the translation of it literally will be Jesus the anointed. He had to be anointed. He has to be consecrated. The anointed, the anointment verses are in uh, in Luke chapter four, and it's a fulfillment of Isaiah. Um, so, since we'll end with this, we can go to it. So, the laver, the washing, <coughs> to make the priest consecrated is you. The sacrifices, our Lord Jesus Christ, the lifestyle of our Lord Jesus Christ. You receive the, the Holy Spirit and because you're going to be baptized, then you are a priest. Each one of us is a priest. And it's this, the symbol, the, to prove this is very easy. Old Testament, the tabernacle, the only ones who can enter the tabernacle are the, the Levites. The Levites are the priests or the ones who do the priestly work. Aaron and his sons and the Levites. In the New Testament, you have to be a Levite to enter the church. If the Old Testament... The tabernacle as a symbol, you only, the priest enter it, let alone the New Testament church, because the New Testament church is not a building on earth, it's a building in heaven. So God has to ordain you as a Levite in order to enter the New Testament. So it, it's very, very simple proof that God does not change his word. He said, only priests enter my house, and he doesn't change his word. So how did he do it in the New Testament? He ordained all of us as priests, which is consecration by the Holy Spirit because he will not change his system that he put in the Old Testament. He fulfills it. Are you getting this idea? So Old Testament tabernacle only entered by the Levites. New Testament, I will make all my children Levites, but really Levites, which is I live in them. I can enter into them. They are my house. So Exodus 29, the consecration of the high priest is your baptism as well. Let's, let's look about this. He anointed me to, to proclaim... Um, salvation to the broken hearted. Let's open St. Luke chapter 4. four. 
uh, from verse 16. Just opened here. Billy can read this for you. Do you have it ready? No, I didn't. Okay. Mina, do you have it ready? Yeah. Oh, I want us to read from 16 to 21. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom says, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Okay, yes. sorry to interrupt you. See, what did the Spirit of the Lord do, do to Christ? Anointed him. But the Spirit of the Lord is the Spirit of Christ, because that's the Holy Spirit. So here is the wafers mixed with oil, and what? covered with oil. This is the life of Christ, which we are imitating. So in, in consecrating you as a priest, you follow the sacrifice of Christ, you follow the lifestyle of Christ, which is the consecration of you, and, and this is this is what, what the baptism and the anointment does to us. But he says here, because he has anointed me, and that's why the term is Messiah, he is, he is Jesus the anointed. And it's um, in Leviticus 2, and in, in Exodus 29, where we see these wafers mixed with oil and covered with oil, both of them. Are we getting the idea here? How the Holy Spirit is, is one with Christ in nature and anointing Christ. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Okay, that's another loaded thing also. We covered it before, just repeated here, repeat it here in brevity. Acceptable year of the Lord. This is a very, very, um, not just a symbolic term. The Jubilee year, which comes once every 50 years, this is what it means here. The Jubilee year is where the, all of the captives are released. And the people who lost their land, they returned to their land. And we stressed enough when we studied Leviticus, it says the land, we didn't say, the Bible doesn't say the land returns to them. It says they return to the land. Because every person is defined by his land in the Old Testament, which is the symbol that we are defined by the kingdom of heaven. That's our land. So the Jubilee year, two things happen. Everybody who is a slave becomes free. And everybody who was exiled from his land returns to his land. Do you see any symbols here in Christ? Again, every person who's a slave, the 50th year when it comes, which comes, that's Jubilee. Count seven times seven years, and that year after it becomes the Jubilee. Two events happen in the Jubilee year. Because of poverty, because anything, you lost your land, you return to it. You don't lose your identity. And... If you were a slave, you get to, set, to be set free. Any symbolic to what, what is happening here when Christ is reading this? Related to proclaim, remove the acceptable year and to proclaim the jubilee year of the Lord. No, him, him coming. Because he's saying, he's telling us and look through this, that when Christ came, no matter what year it is, it became the jubilee year. And I'm trying to tell you in the Jubilee year, in the Old Testament, these two events happen. So how do they apply to Christ and us? Um, like, the slaves are free. So, like, we are freed from our sin. Exactly. Um, and then... Oh. <laughs> we return to our land means what? And return to our land is, like, we return to Christ, heaven, God. What is our identity? Heavenly or earthly? Heaven, our citizenship is so in heaven. Is time more closely to the crucifixion or towards his resurrection? No, no, this is the very beginning. It's the very beginning. So, when the Old Testament puts a system for the Jubilee year, and when Christ reads this, and it's also from Isaiah, I can't remember Isaiah, but there might be a footnote about quoting this also in Isaiah. I um, can't remember where that is. So, he's telling, he's telling us here, when I come, it's Jubilee. 
because when I come, I will set you free, and when I come, you will return back to heaven. And that is, he's not, he's not making this up, this is actually written in what he read, which tells us again that when he's given the book, he's reading what's given, there's a certain system for the reading. He didn't flip and say, what would we read today? It's the verse of the day. It's the, it's the chapter of the day. As exactly when we have in the church, today is what date it is. And we exactly open a certain reading. So the things are not made up. Let everything be according to, uh, to, to, to the plan, not according to randomness. So here Christ is telling us, I am the anointed. I am one with the Holy Spirit. And I came to let everybody to go free. And I came to open the eyes of the blind spiritually. And I came to set you free, and I came to return you back to your land. I am the Jubilee. My existence means that the Jubilee is fulfilled. You don't have to celebrate this every 50 year. You can celebrate it every single day, every single liturgy. If you're baptized, because this happens only later on if, if the person is baptized. If not, then we cannot participate in any, in any of this. So um, I'll stop here. I, I, I went back to this just to tell you where is the reference of Christ saying about himself that he's anointed. Um, let's just continue a couple of verses because he says that this has been fulfilled, that this, this passage has been fulfilled. And they didn't understand how it's fulfilled because it's only fulfilled on him. So 2021. 20, yeah. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Okay, so it's only in Christ. The scripture is fulfilled in him. So may God really let us celebrate our baptism and chrismation and communion and relive it and rethink about it and enjoy it and and just know that um, that we, we were consecrated. 99.9% .9 happened to us when we were babies. Um, not enjoy it, but we can live it in the joy of others um, when they get consecrated as well. Any questions? So we'll continue the rest of the symbols. Um, crossing the Jordan River, you can feel free to, to read the rest and prepare them. Uh, and we'll see why also crossing the Jordan River, not just the Red Sea, um, happened. And why did it have to start by crossing? This is actually when they entered the Promised Land. Thank you.